The European human rights system is a well-established and multifaceted system which nevertheless faces a number of challenges today. Uh, the system has its origins in uh, the aftermath of the Second World War and in reviving uh, Europe from the wars and atrocities, but it is also closely linked to the creation of the Council of Europe uh, as a means of European integration. The system also is linked to uh, the, the Cold War and the reconfiguration of Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, usually the focus in the system is on the European Convention of Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, particularly the existence of the European Court of Human Rights as a means to monitor states' performance judicially uh, and to award damages to victims of human rights violations and induce states to change their laws and practices leads to the argument uh, that the system is one of the most advanced, if not the advanced system, uh, in terms of implementation. And that is of course true because the court has produced impressive case law over time. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, the system is much more varied. Uh, next to the Council of Europe with its 47 member states and 800 million people, uh, there is also two other Europes in human rights terms. Uh, one is the European Union, which started as an exercise uh, in economic integration, turned into a political union and is now a key human rights player externally but also internally for the way it has given itself a human rights structure. And the second is the OSCE, the Organization of Security and, Europe, uh, security and Cooperation in Europe, which is a historic transatlantic security arrangement, uh, which nevertheless does essential human rights work today, from election monitoring to protecting press freedom to conducting peace missions. Uh, despite these interlocking treaties and institutions on the European level, the system nevertheless ch faces challenges uh, challenges, uh, some of which are particularly European, others which are in line with uh, uh, threats to human rights, multilateral institutions, democracy and the rule of law worldwide. The Council of Europe particularly has been responding to these threats over time uh, because it is founded on the values of human rights, democracy and the rule of law. Indeed, those are part of the Council statute, which reaffirms individual freedom, political liberty and the rule of law. Uh, it is precisely on this basis that the European Convention on Human Rights was adopted in 1950. And it was adopted with a threefold purpose, to assist European integration, uh, to promote freedom, democracy and the rule of law in Europe, and to take first steps for the collective enforcement of human rights, uh, based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which uh, did not have such enforcement means. But we need to bear in mind that Europe was divided at that time in East and West, and as a consequence, uh, the rights enshrined in the Convention are essentially um, civil and political rights. Socioeconomic rights were relegated to the European Social Charter of 1961, um, uh, which uh, still remains more a set of aspirational norms, programmatic, uh, programmatic norms, uh, rather than uh, uh, a means to access the European Court of Human Rights. It is a document which is still little known outside expert circles. The European Convention on Human Rights today, with its 16 protocols, covers core civil political rights, which include fair trial guarantees, free elections, uh, property rights, or the abolition of death penalty. It's a well-crafted text. It's a text that on the one hand protects individual rights, but on the other hand seeks to establish a common European public order. It's a text uh, which is a dynamic and living instrument, while at the same time taking into account states' concern and allowing for a margin of appreciation uh, in interpreting human rights. There is a strong emphasis in the Convention on democracy and the rule of law, preserving democracy, uh, democratic institution, and the values of pluralism, tolerance, and broad-mindedness are considered as cornerstones of the system. And likewise, the rule of law is a core principle that the court spells out in many of its judgments uh, um, to have an accessible and foreseeable legal framework binding on states to limit executive discretion, to have transparent investigations, and to have respect for binding forces or for the binding force of court judgments. The right to asylum is not mentioned in the Convention. Yet, as we all know, the migration flows of the past years have given rise to considerable human rights challenges in Europe. Uh, in its last report, the European Commission on Human Rights has rightly raised this matter uh, and has asked states uh, to improve the treatment of migrants, asylum seekers and refugees uh, and uh, to rely on the principle of responsibility sharing which should be at the center of migration and asylum policies in Europe. Europe also has, outside the European Convention, the only legally binding document for the protection of minorities, 
the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities. Um, at the same time, and despite this achievement, uh, the fate of Roma people in Europe uh, is still an issue uh, that needs to be tackled uh, with this minority group suffering deep-rooted discrimination and prejudices in many European countries. But it is, of course, really the European Court of Human Rights which has helped dynamically expand human rights standards in Europe. Uh, the court, which since 1998 operates as a single permanent court, uh, decides on admissibility of cases, uh, allows individual applications, delivers judgments, allows for friendly settlements, and uh, awards damages to victims, and more recently also provides for advisory opinions. The court has handed down more than 10,000 judgments today, uh, and while it operates only when domestic remedies are exhausted, uh, it is nevertheless an accessible, practical and effective safeguard. It is able to issue binding judgments and states are obliged not only to pay financial damages to victims, but also to take individual and general measures to remedy human rights violations. It is also to be said, though, that the court has become, in a way, a victim of its own success. The caseload of the court is enormous. It's adjudicating for 800 million people in 47 states, and more than 60,000 cases are presently pending, many cases being repetitive and many cases being inadmissible. The court is, as a consequence, undergoing a constant reform process to ensure that it can keep its role both in deciding the most important human rights cases in Europe and being open and accessible uh, to victims of human rights violation. A particular challenge is the non-implementation of the court's judgments, which has become a serious problem threatening the credibility and functioning of the system. Cases, cases take longer uh, to be closed as they used to, uh, in some cases as, such as Ukraine, Moldova and Russia, and particularly Russia, Russia, Russia's position uh, of putting the Russian constitution uh, legally and practically above its obligations under the convention as well as uh, the, court's, uh, the court's judgments is a particular challenge. But it also needs to be said that next to the Council of Europe with the Convention and the Court, the European Union has risen to an important pillar of the European human rights system. Um, Article 2 of the founding treaty of the European Union proclaims that the Union itself is based on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality and the rule of law. And that pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity and equality are cornerstones of European societies and European states. The Union recognizes not only the rights in the European Convention of Human Rights, but it has given itself its own foundational text, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which has the same value, legal value, as the treaties upon which the Union is, is found, founded. The text is innovative. In part, it goes beyond uh, what the European Convention provides for. And most importantly, it allows the EU's own court, the European Court of Justice, to apply human rights to actions of the Union which effectively puts another layer of human rights protection over EU states which are also members of, Council, members of the Council of Europe. Um, furthermore, the Union wishes to accede to the European Convention of Human Rights uh, to ensure that the actions of the Union are in line with the Convention. The Union is also keen to project human rights in its external relations. It does so in the form of human rights and democratization policies, neighborhood policies, human rights dialogues, and it has two important instruments at its disposal. One is the European Instrument for Democracy and Human Rights, a financial funding scheme for allowing promotion and learning about human rights. And the other is a human rights watchdog, the Fundamental Rights Agency, which provides the Union with assistance and expertise on fundamental rights. The Union can also act against human rights violators in its own ranks. Article 7 of the Treaty of the European Union allows, in a rather complex multi-step procedure, to determine a serious breach by a member state of human rights values. And indeed, the Union has instituted such proceedings presently against Poland and Hungary for threats against the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary. As these examples, of course, demonstrate, and despite all achievements that Europe has, uh, has reached, uh, the continent needs to remain vigilant to protect and promote human rights in the future. 